even though I have no technical IT degree, and then I worked at Coca-Cola for 25 years, so literally half my life, the truth in my heart is that I worked at Coke for 25 years and I knew within three months that I was going to be working in data. Oh, the trouble it? was it took me 25 years before I made the, <laughs> made the move. Now, I've had a long-standing wish of connecting with really brainy and smart people around in the area of data and Power BI and have them over on the YouTube channel and have conversations about data and skill sets and several things that we generally don't really speak about because we are too busy discussing about the technical nitty-gritty stuff. Now, this could have been a personal endeavor, but I thought it would be a nice thing to just call them over, have them interviewed and share that recording with you people. Let's go. Hi Matt, welcome to the show here. Yeah. Hi, Jenny. Thanks very much for the invitation and opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. For the people who maybe don't know about you, would you mind maybe introducing yourself? Uh, what's the kind of work that you do and uh, what keeps you engaged these days? Yeah, sure. So my name is Matt Allington and I'm a pro professional Power BI consultant. I've been on a journey. In fact, I'm coming up to nine years as a professional Power BI consultant which is quite interesting because Power BI is, I think it's seven years, I think 2015. 15, so Power BI is going yeah, to be eight in July and I'm going to be nine years in um, April. So my Power BI journey actually started before Power BI, which is a interesting little fun fact. Um, some of your viewers might know that Power Pivot for Excel was Absolutely. effectively version zero version 0 0.1 of power bi right and they, remember that product um power view power right. view was the first excel based product which was um anyway they threw that all away <laughs> and started again which was probably a good idea so anyway so i'm a, a power bi consultant have been so for pretty much nine years my background prior to that uh, i worked i had a foundation learning uh, the supermarket trade so i actually Worked in a supermarket, packing boxes, pushing trolleys, stacking oh, shelves, was it? Okay. those sorts of things. I did that for eight years through various roles. And and then I worked at Coca-Cola for 25 years. So literally half my life <laughs> spent at Coca-Cola. Um, so, yeah, I had good commercial, fast-moving consumer goods experience, right? So, so that's really the stuff that I know best. And uh, through my time at Coke, I learned about supply chain and if you're working in any big organization, you'll learn some HR and some finance sure. stuff and all those sorts of things. So before I became a consultant, I worked in a business mm -hmm. and I now like to think of myself working more on a business. So I help people on process improvement, primarily through the development and delivery of Power BI Certainly. tools. A little bit of Power Pivot, a little bit of Power Query for Excel. Not so much. I've got a couple of clients that still use that. Mm -hmm. But um, these days, Power BI is where it's at. So great. Um, it takes up most of, most of my time. Great, great. Did you actually take a look at the very first version of Power BI when it came out and transitioned right after uh, using Power Pivot? And, or maybe was it a couple of iterations later? Very astute question. Um, so yes, I looked at it and I made an assessment and my assessment was this is not worth my oh, time. Oh, is it? Because uh, version one, and I'm pretty sure it was version one. So I think 2015, July, it went GA. And when it first came out, I did a quick assessment and I said, no, nah, this is not ready for the mainstream. And you, you have to appreciate the amount of development that's gone in since then, so over the last seven absolutely, years. Absolutely. So only things that come top of mind, you used to have a mate, there's always been a matrix. You couldn't wrap the text in the title of a matrix when it first came out. You couldn't do it. You couldn't even resize the columns from memory. Someone might correct me here in the in the comments below. But my recollection was at one stage you couldn't resize the columns then you could resize them, but you couldn't wrap the text. And so look, these are just basic things for uh, for any reporting tool that has to meet a minimum quality That's right. to be able to use in production. So, I mean, there were a lot of people, of course, using it. Um, I think there were companies were on the early adopter program with Microsoft and giving feedback. And that's great if you've got the resource to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, in, in my early stage, I was a year into my consulting business. I just didn't have the time. And all of my clients and customers at that point in time were Power Pivot for Excel. 
Mm -hmm. our query for Excel. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of training like you. I do a lot of training. And um, and so, yeah, I just didn't see any reason for me to stop using Power Pivot and to move over to Power BI. But that changed. So I seem to remember just short of the second birthday. So that must be 2017, I'm guessing, sort of early 2017. Uh -huh. And I thought to myself, maybe it was like October 2016, and I thought to myself, hmm, this is getting pretty good now. I'm going to have to have a look at this product because they were very quickly closing the gaps. As you know, they have the monthly build cycle, right. which is fantastic for, for keeping momentum for the team, but also keeping interest for the audience. Did you keep going back to the product every now and then to kind of take a look at what's happening? Or maybe was it just like one fine day you took a look at it and says it's ready now? No, I, I used to keep track. I mean, if I can give anyone advice sign up to the power bi blog right. so i've been um i have a rss feed or something if then if this then that whatever anyway i get it every time there's a, a blog on the power bi official website i get an email and i always i always have a look at it when it comes to the new release even today i still do a quick review uh -huh. watch the video on double speed or something like that do a quick review of what's new um, I don't always need what's new straight away, but I like to know what's coming and just I mentally feel the, the holes that existed in my in my mind of where the gaps were. Mm -hmm. um, so so back in, I've done this from the start. So back sure. then I used to get the email and no, no, no. And then, yeah, as I said, I reckon about 18 months to just short of two years was the, I distinctly remember having that experience where I said, I really now need to look at this. Sure. Now, there was another parallel thing that was happening. So originally, a little bit of history, originally Microsoft released Power Pivot for Excel 2010. You may remember this. That's trendy. right. That's and right. it was a plug-in. And then they released Power Query for Excel 2010, and that was also, also a plug-in. Plug That's right. And because those plugins were developed um, independently of Excel, there was a very high ability for the development team to bug fix, do incremental releases and those sorts of things. Now, at some point in 2013, Microsoft migrated Power Pivot for Excel over to the main part of Microsoft Office slash Excel. And when that happened, they lost the ability to do the rapid development cycle. Mm -hmm. This is so this is before Office 365 was really a big thing. That's right. That's right? right. So this that's this right. is back when we had packaged software. So, <laughs> yeah. so they would release Power Pivot for Excel 2013 and it was as buggy as anything. It was <laughs> really bad. I found it very frustrating. So I was teaching Power Pivot for Excel. It would crash during my, my classes. And you know, people coming in wanting a fresh experience with a brand new piece of software were increasingly becoming frustrated with Power Pivot That's for right. Excel because of its in, uh, instability. And so that was actually one of the reasons and the impetus that I basically switched my practice and also training over the Power BI desktop. Way that up, uh, there was another issue was that most people back in those days with Microsoft Office had 32-bit Microsoft Office. That's right. And Power Pivot really needs 64-bit, 64 64 right? And having those, having those two things installed was a big issue. That's so, right. yeah, so these are the things, the historical things that really <laughs> um, drove the, the changes in, in my business over that time. So taking a bit to the history, you want to talk about maybe during your tenure with Coke, when was the first time or the first instances when you came across working with data just in general? And when did you decide, hey, this is the thing that I'd like to do? Or did it eventually become <laughs> that? Well, the, <laughs> must be data, I mean, huh? it, <laughs> well, a lot of people in Power BI today may not be, I mean, I've done a couple of interviews in the past, sure. but you know, they're quite some time ago now. So many people may not have may not be aware of those and may not know me anyway. The truth in my heart is that I worked at Coke for 25 years and I knew within three months that I was going to be working in data. Oh, the that? trouble was it took it took me 25 years before I made the, <laughs> made the move. I mean, I think some people just like data. Some people just like computers. I was a computer programming guy. Even though I, I have no technical IT degree, um, I remember in my first year at Coke, uh, we had a um, IBM A400 computer system, mainframe with the green screens. I don't know if you remember those. We had one single laptop, uh, it wasn't a laptop, one single desktop computer in the entire organization when I first started. 
Oh, and okay. um, and they had Lotus One Two Three, the green version of Lotus One Two Three, on that laptop computer. And I used to come in after I'd stayed back until everyone left the office and go and turn that computer on. And I learned to use Lotus One Two Three, and I actually learned to program using macros in uh, Lotus One Two Three. Was, was there macros in Lotus One Two Three? Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. Okay. It was all keyboard driven, so you actually used to. You actually put the formulas in a cell, mm-hmm. and and the macro would start in the top cell and work its way down uh, as an instruction code set. It was uh, that's my reaction anyway. Yeah, I never knew um, that. Yeah, so look, I always loved data, and in fact, uh, I was working in sales at the time. I had an opportunity when I was at Coke very early on to take a a data analyst role, and. Uh, the the problem was, um, we, first of all, I would have loved that role. It would it was right up my alley. I'm sh- I'm sure someone identified my slant towards data and offered me that job. But the trouble was that Coke is a sales company, mm-hmm. and I had um, I had visions of grandeur of taking um, steps up the hierarchy within the sales at Coca Cola because I wanted I was trying to build a career. And it's an interesting challenge for anyone who's interested in data because many people would find themselves in the same situation as me my passion was data but i couldn't see a career path that i felt would reach my salary objectives my seniority objectives through the organization now that doesn't mean that other organizations are the same that's just the way i interpreted the situation at uh, at coke while i was there so yeah so it was very early on that i identified my in data but i stayed in sales for well for uh, 15 years actually uh, before i actually moved into it i moved into and, and actually i did make a uh, switch and um but even all that time that i worked in sales i always i was always a pc guy i was a data guy so you know people would come and knock on my on my cubicle can you help me with this can you help me with that i can't get this i can't get that you know, I was that, um, you know, that guy or girl in the organization who knows how to get stuff done through mm-hmm. using technology. They can't get it from an IP. I was that guy. So people would always come and ask me for this sort of stuff. Um, the, yeah, so I, yes, so. The role that you took over, which was the data analyst role, was it a formal role created or it just came out of the opportunity of working with data? Because you just had one computer in the office. So yeah, like, so that was originally. Okay. So this was, I mean, I'm, t- I'm telling you, this is going back a bit, right? So this is <laughs> 19, this is 89, 89, 90. I'm really like testing that. your memory out here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, PCs started to roll into the business around then. So by the time this analyst opportunity came around, the opportunity uh, existed and, um, you know, PCs were starting to come in. And there might have been a PC in this analyst role already. Um, maybe I'm confusing the PCs in sales against the, the PCs that were available for the analysts. So it was an existing role. It was a real role. But a lot of the work back in those days, so so we used to get all of our sales data, so not sales data, sorry, more specifically market share data from AC Nielsen. So AC Nielsen is a, um, a marketplace data collector. They go and collect data. And then back in those days, we used to get it in books. Like we'd get these like hardbound oh, uh, books that contain all the data. So you'd it would be indexed at the front. And so you want to find out the share of uh, Coca-Cola 2 litre in this particular region. You'd flip the page and look up the date column and you'd get the number and then you'd type it out sort of thing. It was, oh. I mean, it was very, very old school. I mean, I sound like this is pre-computer, but <laughs> this is the way it used to work. And, and a lot of the sales data we used to get through the AS400, but they used to print it out on those great big um, green and white printed paper. Have you ever, you know, the really long, uh, right. endless loops of paper with uh, the holes down the side. I mean, that's how we used to get our sales reports. And so what the analysts used to do is we, they'd go through these books and paper and pull the key numbers out and basically prepare data for the sales managers and those sorts of things. I'm not sure how much of it was computerized originally, but, um, but you know, I could have definitely made something of that job if I chose to do it. I do wonder where I would have ended up if I'd gone down that track. I, I had a very successful career as it was at Coke, and I, you know, I have no, no regrets, and I was able to achieve many things that I wanted to achieve. But I do wonder 
you know, where I would have ended up if I made that passion decision early on rather than the financial uh, career path decision. Mm. Interesting, interesting. One question that comes to my mind is that what do you think are the skills which are more or less similar in, let's say, a BI or a data analyst professional, which were required back then when you were working with hardbound papers and books that used to come to you? And even today, uh, when you have all the possible technology to just analyze anything at a flip of a keyboard button or something? I think there's a combination of natural thinking style. Uh I don't know. I mean, there's lots of different psychometric tools available in the world. I've completed a tool called the Herman Brain Dominance Instrument. You may or may not have heard of it, but um, it basically, it's a questionnaire and it asks you 100 questions and they give you feedback about your brain style, like how do you think about problems? Mm -hmm. And so one of those dominant brain styles is analytical. So in Herman Brain Dominance, it's called, uh, it's the blue analytical one. And, and in fact, for anyone who wanted to understand whether they have a bent towards this, I would highly recommend HBDI, Herman Brain Dominance Instrument. And I, I think you have to, I mean, I did it through work, but I, you have to pay for it. It, it might be a hundred bucks or something. I don't know. You'd have to have a look. But it's a really good tool to help you understand how you think. Because everyone thinks differently. So there's basically four sets of, there's four styles. You've got this analytical style. Now, I'm off the chart analytical, right? So there's, you can you basically get a score on all four. I'm off the chart analytical. So that, you know, that's a flag to me that, that that's my style. But there's also strategic, um, there's emotional, and there's um, more detail. So... So blue, analytical, great for analysts. Yellow, strategic, these are CEOs, they're mm-hmm. um, entrepreneurs. Right. Red, you know, HR type people, people who are, um, you know, healthcare workers, those sorts of things. And then the green, the detail, that's the accountants, make sure everything adds up. Right. So you don't have to, you don't have to be, an, you don't have to have accountant skills to be a, um, an analyst you have to have this analytical thinking style and so the, the way I would describe that is I'm curious about stuff like when I see when someone shares some numbers you know when I sort of see the numbers as a bit of a challenge right so if someone said to me you know we sold a hundred dollars this year and 110 the year after before you think about it, I've said ah oh, 10 percent growth mm-hmm you know, because because that's just the way I think. Sure. And um, my wife, she'll say, "Oh, two numbers, one hundred and one hundred and ten." <laughs> Whereas I've worked out the growth in my head because it's just to me, I see those natural patterns, connections in right. the numbers. So I don't think I could be a good nurse, right? <laughs> so so you know, because I don't have the right skills to do that. I don't have the right thinking style. I don't have the right temperament. So I think there's a certain amount has to be innate inside sure. it's got to be your natural style and the hbdi is a good way to, to think about that um i think there's also some domain skill that you need to have some domain understanding so i worked at coca-cola so um because i spent so much time in sales and customer service i understood the selling process mm-hmm. so go to a customer take an order process the order fulfill the order keep the fridge full so Having that end-to-end domain knowledge in the Coca-Cola business means that when I do analytical work for someone at Coca-Cola or indeed someone now in a wholesale business or someone now in any other sort of retail business, I, I understand what the sales process is all about. So if you want to be a good analyst, it is absolutely useful to have domain knowledge. Sure. Now, that doesn't mean that I can't um, help someone do a, a profit and loss statement, which is not directly sales related, but it just means I have to spend more time thinking about, well, what, what is that? You know, what do these numbers mean? Sure. What do you mean you want to see the expenses without a negative sign instead of a pop? You know, you, you have to learn these things as you go. Okay. So it can mean that as you try and cross into a different domain, you have some more to learn. Sure. Um, but but that's okay. That's part of that's the natural part of developing. And then as you operate as a consultant or a trainer, like 
like we do, the more people you cross, the broader your understanding and skill set becomes. Certainly. Um, so, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So when did you take this test that you just spoke about, the uh, Herman Brain Dominance Herman, test? The Herman, yes, uh, like a lifetime ago, basically. Okay. Um, and so apparently it doesn't change much. I'm, I see. I'm actually positive I still got it downstairs um, in my in my heirloom box down there. But it was probably early 90s would be my guess. Um, yeah, so 30 years ago. No, um, I mean, there's yeah, there's various other um, instruments out there, but my understanding from Herman Brain Dominance is that it doesn't change much throughout your life because it's it's really testing your natural thinking style. Not it's, there are other instruments that measure behaviours, and behaviours can be situational, whereas this is this is more about how you how you solve problem. It's a problem or a thinking style is is what they call it. Yeah, so a long time ago and. <laughs> Um, I've got no reason to, th- to think that it's changed because my, if anything, um, it, it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, yeah. right? Because because you, you do the test, they say here are the things that you're best skilled at and then so you go and seek out those job roles and as a result of that you, you reaffirm your, your <laughs> skill in that particular area. Maybe you want to talk about how was it learning the tool Power BI for you initially. I'm, um, I know of it that you started with Rob Coley a uh, long while ago. You got trained mm. with him. So how was it for you picking up the skill of Power Pivot and DAX for yourself? Was it difficult? Did you make any errors? Plenty of errors. I still make errors. Look, to be, to be honest, the hardest thing was starting. So when I first went out as a consultant, my grand plan was that I was going to do Excel stuff. I was going to do SharePoint stuff. Uh-huh. And there was a product called Microsoft InfoPath, okay, which was, a, yeah, it's sort of like a PDF editing tool where you can okay. create forms and fill things in and punch the results into SharePoint. So to me, coming... At the end of my career at Coke, I was using a lot of these tools at work to help build solutions for, for for business units and for my customers. And so I felt that there was an opportunity to build custom business solutions using those tools. So I actually, when I started it, it wasn't Power Pivot. It was Excel, InfoPath, SharePoint. SharePoint. That was my that was my plan. But very quickly, I realized that the future was in Power Pivot. So, but to come back to your question, you know, learning Power Pivot specifically, I had a little bit of hands-on practice. And um, then I went and got some uh, training through Rob Colley. But it wasn't until I got my hands on the tool and started to try and do things myself that I actually felt comfortable. Now, everyone has a different learning style. And everyone has a different innate motivation to get things done. Now, I'll, I'll be honesty corner here. So my wife, if something has to be done, she will do it first thing to make sure it's done because she's uncomfortable if it hasn't been done. Because she doesn't know how to do it, she's uncomfortable, she's got to go and do it, and then she feels at ease. Mm-hmm. I am 100% the opposite. If I don't know how to do something and I'm uncomfortable, I block it out of my mind and focus on anything other than that one thing that I have to learn <laughs> until until I have a deadline that if I don't start today, I'm not going to get it done. And so I need that deadline in order to encourage me to get my hands into the tool and do that learning. Sure. Um, and so I, I took a bit, of, a, a bit of time to get started, but once I got in the tool, um, I didn't find it super complex. Mm -hmm. Um, I've used Microsoft Access in the past. So I I understood the concept of different tables. Um, I didn't have a lot of SQL experience, but I I understand the concept of foreign keys and primary keys. And certainly, I certainly learned a lot more about it very quickly once I I got hands on. Um, The other thing is that I, I did have a consulting job very early on in my career and in my consulting career and a couple, just a couple of days a week. And I built out solutions for, for this customer. Mm-hmm. And so once again, I had a motivation. I had a need to build something. And so I just, I just had to learn it. Sure. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't 
a, a super painful experience as long as you get involved. And then that really um, drove a lot of my downstream thinking on the training that I deliver. So my training okay. course is very hands-on. So um, I, when, I, when we do training, it's instructor-led, and we focus on making sure that the people participating in the training follow along so they're actually doing it themselves. But also, after we've done it, now do it yourself, right? So here's, oh, okay. so let's, so let's, so giving people those opportunities to practice through very early on is a very important part of learning these tools. Now, it's not that the average data analyst can't learn this stuff. Of course they can. The tools are built for these people, but they're sufficiently different that, in my opinion, you must have hands-on practice in order to be able to learn the tool properly. And so that flowed into the training that I delivered, which then ultimately flowed into the book that I wrote, which was specifically designed to give people hands-on practice. Now, here's another little fun fact. So my book's called Supercharge Power BI. Right. Now, the previous version of the book was called Learn to Write DAX. DAX, that's right. Learn to Write DAX. But that wasn't the original name of the book. The original name, which never made it um, into the world, thank goodness, was called Daxercises, as in exercises, oh. but with the word Dax. <laughs> Daxercises, because because the concept of the book was co directly related to what I just said. It was you must get practice in order to learn this tool. You cannot learn the tool by yeah. watching someone else, by watching a video, That's right. by reading a book. You cannot learn this tool. You need to have some practice. True. And so the whole concept was, you know, I'll give you some practice exercises, so, right? Uh, and so hence the name Daxercises. But it was a terrible name. <laughs> and arguably... Um, Arguably, Learn to Write DAX wasn't a great name either. I think today it would be a good name for a book. But when I wrote the, the book Learn to Write DAX, which was 2015, so remember Power BI has just come out. I launched in uh, my book in December 2015 from memory. Da uh, Power BI had just come out. People didn't even know what DAX was. That's right. So, so I've got a book to teach you how to learn to write DAX, and you don't you even know, know that you need to learn to write DAX. That's right. And so that's why when I did the second edition of the book, I renamed it. And my daughter had just spent some time sharing with me a video about how Apple operates differently in the world. And Apple gives you reasons why you should do something. And then later on, they give you a product that solves that problem. Interesting. So, you know, and so we literally just watched this video. I don't remember what it was, but explaining this concept of tell people why and then tell them how. And so I'm just about to release the second version of my book, and I thought, why Why do people want to learn to write DAX? Well, the reason is because they want to supercharge Power BI. Yeah, right. And so, therefore, I changed the name of the book, Supercharge Power BI. Power BI is better when you learn to write DAX. And that, that's the... That's the untold history of, um, okay. of my book. I picked up your book, I remember. Uh, it was the second book uh, I picked up after, I think the third book maybe. So the first two books were Rob Colley's book. Yep. And the second book was uh, Marco's and Alberto's book, but it was not the definitive guide to learning DAX. Uh, yeah. It was, I believe, uh, Modeling with Power BI, something like that, uh, in 2013 Excel. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. Yep. So that's the one that I picked up. And then I did not understand anything out of it. But then, then yeah. I picked up your book. And the one thing that I really liked about the book was the practice exercises. I mean, I was just the fan of the book that it teaches you something. Then it has these exercises that you have to do. Now, with the exercises, there is a, always a curiosity in my mind that have I done it right? Let me just compare it with the results of what the author has given to me. So that was phenomenal in terms of just building up the just the confidence of writing DAX that does not give you errors. So that was yes. absolutely phenomenal. How did you think of the idea of maybe just putting in the examples in there? It's, it's not rocket science. There's two things. Well, so first of all, I read Rob's book and I read Marco's book, both fantastic books. And I sat in front of my cute computer and I couldn't write DAX. I did exactly the same that you did. And I knew what I was missing was practice. And at this stage, I was doing the delivery of training to one of my first courses. And 
I'm sure I credited him in my first book. Uh, so this was this was my first book. Uh, That's right. Learn to write Dax. Um, was it Phil? Um, anyway, there was someone who told me that they what was missing in the world was an exercise book where we could go ahead and uh, and do some practice. And it was really through that suggestion that I decided Nick uh, Colbach here. Yeah, I think I was talking with Nick recently. Um, yeah, so it was his original idea. He said. And this is, comes back to that Dax exercises, right? Because because right. at that time Rob Colley's book it was was a very was is a very good book, but there was no practice. So my original idea was you read Rob's book and then do the practice exercises in my book, right? So read them in parallel, and so that was my idea, and that's why it was called Dax exercises. Um, but then I actually caught up with Chandu. So Chandu's a a legend yeah, and hero in the absolutely. Excel world. <laughs> and I was telling Chandu um, about this idea of having, and he said, no, 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 he said, don't do that. He said, you write your own book. Don't worry about Rob. Rob's done his own book. There's nothing wrong with making your own standalone book. You don't have to write a companion book on your own. And oh, it was really okay. through his coaching that, that I decided to make it as a standalone book. So basically insert my own instructional guide about data modeling and loading right. tables and then adding the exercises in at the back of that. So that that's sort of really the, the background. But it was always intended to be that book that you just described to cater for the crowd who I just knew, based on my own personal experience, would not be able to learn the skills if I didn't have any practice. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I credit all of that to your book, uh, The Initial Starting Days, because I was writing it and then I just would run into errors and I had no clue as to what to do. I mean, you have a sample text in front of you, but that doesn't really apply to the problem that you're solving with your own data. So I had to step back from the problem that I was solving on my own data, go to the book and just do the exercises that you were giving it to me and understand the logic as to why they were working mm -hmm. and then come back and do that on my own data yeah. to understand, okay, this is where I made a mistake. So that was very, very helpful indeed. Yes. Excellent. Now, well, and so I do, sorry, I'm, I'm sort of taking over a little no, bit here, no but it's, it's, rele it's relevant because I have a training course um, for an introductory training course. I have a number of training courses, um, but I also have an, an advanced training course because people say to me, okay, now I want to do an advanced training course. So what I've learnt is that, well, first of all, you have to be basic before you can be advanced. And so I call my course intermediate slash advanced. Mm -hmm. And the reason I do that is if I call it intermediate, no one wants to come because everyone thinks they're past the intermediate stage. But the reality is most people are not. I mean, there are some people who are. I'm not saying no one is past the intermediate, but most people are not. And so what I encourage people to do is get the base understanding of how DAX works, practice on your own data, get six to 18 months hands-on experience using the data exactly as you just described, Candy. Um, and then when you've made mistakes, when you're frustrated because you can't work out why this is not working, when you've had a few wounds and you've got a few scars, then come back and do my intermediate advanced course. And I teach people very few new functions, maybe three new functions. Uh -huh. well, all I really teach, you know, calculate the all function, the filter function. The all function, filter function, calculate, make up 90-odd percent of my advanced absolutely. training course. Yeah, absolutely. But, if you under, but if you understand those functions, then you can solve any problem. And I find some of the stuff that I used to teach very early on, and, in fact, the more difficult concepts in my book when people are first learning they are not primed and they're not ready to learn those more complex techniques you must get some experience before you understand the gravity of the concept and so i throw people back into the jungle get them six to 18 months experience then come back and then i spend a lot of time in that course just explaining how it works and why it works sure and sure. once you understand that then you can go and pick up the definitive guide to DAX and understand what they're talk. You know those guys are talking about because uh, I mean they're they're the best. They're the advanced guys. But I think also you know Marco and Alberto teach people from a SQL background. That's their heritage. Right. Our heritage is Excel, right? Excel. Their heritage is is SQL. And I mean you can take a a more of a database approach to Power BI, and you can also take more of a 
I don't want to say a spreadsheet approach, but um, more of a simplified database approach uh, if you more come from an Excel background. Visual, so, visual right. approach, like you take a look at the data in Excel and you write the, I mean, with Excel is that yeah. you write the formulas in the cells inherently cells is what you get in excel so people don't realize that this is a cell it's like a row of the data so yeah that confuses kind of creates a bit of problems when you're working with it, does. Uh, it, it in power bi so it absolutely does yeah. and but inherent in in your description is writing the formula in a cell but then um, of, often we'll copy that formula down and then we'll get a total down the bottom but there's a lot to unpack from that because what you're actually doing is testing on a single line of data That's before right. you move on. Right. And then when you copy that formula down, you're saying, I need this same formula to apply for everything in this table. And then when you put a sum at the bottom, you're saying, I actually want to aggregate the totals, which as you would know, being okay. Power Pivot, Power BI, that's not always what you get with DAX. And that's so, right. Uh, right. and then that sort of leads into the SUMX topic, which is another one of my favorite topics that once you understand how that really works, um, um, it basically, it's a good tool to solve every problem. <laughs> I think in my opinion, the invisibility of DAX is what makes it complicated and nothing else. I mean, because you have written a piece of code, it doesn't really evaluate line by line by line. And you just have to evaluate the filter context visually in your mind, probably. I mean, there are tools to do it, but then when you're starting out as a no voice, I mean, you'll have to probably visualize uh, the filter context in your mind, and then probably you get to see the results. So there's a bit of a black box in between that evaluates the formula, the three-stage filter process that I read out from the book, and then you kind of get the results. So that's, I believe, what makes it challenging not to be able to see it visually. Absolutely. And I learned that authoring technique from Rob. I mean, yeah. Rob is a, you know, a great Excel guy in his own right, and he was part of the Power Pivot team. He taught me exactly what you just described. So if you want to work this out, I tell people, do not start to write a formula, put a matrix on the table, stick a base measure, total sales, whatever, in the matrix so you can see what's going on. Put something in the first column, put product category or product subcategory or customer, put something in there so that it looks like an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> because if you don't get that immediate feedback that we're used to as Excel people, um, you're going to do your head in. Whereas if you go back to the other guys, I'm not, I'm not criticising them, I'm just saying they're different, right? So if you go to... Alberto and Marco, they're more than happy firing up tabular editor <laughs> and writing right. a, writing a formula, which is basically building table queries without seeing any data. They'll finish the formula and then pop it in and say, oh, yeah, that works. <laughs> but, you know, that, that doesn't work for us. That doesn't That's work right. for someone coming from an Excel background. You need to build that Excel-like experience by sticking a matrix in the visual and build your formula one step at a time. Build the first piece, build the second piece, build the third piece until you've got the answer that you need. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I totally use Excel a lot still to this day to debug a lot of my calculations to take a look at, like to extract the data. Now you have functions like CSVs to extract the data and stuff like that, but I still use DAX Studio and Excel a lot till this day to kind of debug as to what's happening in my DAX. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally get what you're saying. And now that you think of it like Power BI is, I mean, five years ago, if I would have said that I know pretty much a lot of Power BI because there was just like Power BI desktop and service, and now it's become such a gigantic piece of application, which so much interconnectedness between other applications that Microsoft is trying to build, uh, not to mention that the DAX and query and other parts of Power BI itself are pretty deep and pretty wide itself. Where would you recommend a beginner should begin? Like what's what's the core mm -hmm. that hasn't changed or what's, what is it that which comprises of, let's say, 20% that's still going to get you 80% of the results? That's a good question. I totally associate with your experience. So when I started, I, I guess the two core products, three, three core skills. There's the data modeling, so the DAX, the loading the tables, the relationships, that sort of stuff. There's the power query stuff, so the ETL, the extract, transform, load, shape your data. And then there's the visualization capability. You know, how does the whole visualization layer work? And then you've got sharing online. But I mean, that's the core of the product. Um, so that's what I learned on. That's, I'm sure, what you learned on, Chandy. But if you look at the, what's happened since then, we've got data flows, we've got um, all the enterprise tools, you've got um, 
report server, you've got That's right. paginated reports, you've got all this sort of stuff. And I don't even know all of those things. So what I know is that they exist. So come back to what I said before about um, on the Power BI blog. I know everything that goes out on the Power BI blog. Now, sometimes I'll just delete the email and say, um, thanks a lot, but I don't care. Right? So I just delete it. Um, but there'll be sometimes things come out that say, you know, this has been released. Oh, that's interesting. I'll just I'll store that away for for another day. I'll remember that one day. I'll still probably have to go back to the blog for the detail later on. But it's more about just trying to keep keep up with what's changing. I think if you want to be a consultant or if you want to be a standalone data analyst within a business, I think you need to be good at Power BI Desktop. I think that's a great place to start. If you want to start a little bit slower, you could start with Power Query for Excel. I'm astonished when I deliver training classes, and we're back to live training here in Australia now, which is absolutely fantastic. Every time I had a live training class and I stood up in the class, I say, how many people have heard of Power Query? Mm-hmm. And the answer has been the same for nine years. It's about 15% of the class. And these that are the number people of... working with data that you're speaking about who haven't heard of Power yes. Query? Yes. Oh, I see. It's, okay. it's astonishing. It's astonishing. Now, some of them may have used it but just don't know what it's called because the branding's not that good, although it is better now. Um, but there are so many data people or people who, are, who need to do reporting who don't understand or not aware of Power Query. And Power Query is a lot easier to learn and get started Absolutely. than DAX. So if, you, if someone wants a first step, they're not really ready to jump out of Excel, I'd suggest start with Power Query for Excel, find it on the menu, go and do some Googling and start using it to solve some of your problems. The other thing that will happen with Power Query, if you learn it, is that very quickly it will enable you to free up time in your day. Absolutely. I because more, because yes. people doing repetitive tasks, consolidating CSV files together once a month, blah, 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 that's a great place to find some time in your day. That's so I would highly recommend that. Um, as far as moving to Power BI, then, of course, the Power Query skills migrate completely over. Um, you know, Obviously, I recommend my book, but there's plenty of other great resources out there where you can learn DAX and data modeling. Um, you have to have a reason to build a data model. Um, I would encourage people to find a reason. So, you know, you can do so much learning using the AdventureWorks database. But a lot of the stuff that I've learned has been using things in my personal life that I'm interested in. So um, I did a whole lot of work on when I had my solar electricity installed. Right. I've got a data logger on my solar electricity. I know how much electricity my roof produces, how much I'm bringing off the grid, how much I'm sending mm-hmm. back to the grid. I built a stack of reports using Power BI, and I learned a lot of things about visualizing sure. data and DAX. Um, at the moment here in Australia, we've got some floods going down. At, at the largest river in Australia is the Murray River, and um, we've had a lot of rain in Sydney. You might have heard about that sort of a, going back six or eight months ago. Well, it's all downstream now, and we've got a family holiday house on the riverbank, and it's currently uh, two metres underwater. Oh. And so I, I, was, I spent a lot of time downloading. I knew this was coming. Uh-huh. So there's a lot of data around. So there's um, various places up the river. We've got um, height, uh, river height measurements, data flow, uh, water flow measurements. Uh-huh. And so I downloaded the data and I built a whole range of reporting tools to allow me to predict when our holiday house was going to get flooded. And so the point I'm making is everyone has something that they're interested in. Download your credit card statement from your bank and start classifying it by uh, expenditure category and do some trend analysis and work out where you're spending your money. Everyone's got something. So find something that you care about and start using Power Query to clean the data. And if if you want to, start using either Power Pivot for Excel or Power BI to, uh, to model the data as well. Sure. The one thing that I've personally struggled with while delivering in-person training sessions is that it's very easy to talk about our query because you could just maybe show up a screen and you could just maybe click the buttons on the top and the things start to happen. People are excited about it. It's also maybe to the next level. It's sort of easy uh, relatively 
to kind of start talking about DAX and some and some X and things like that. But then what I have personally felt, it's very hard to talk about the model that sits at the back, which should ideally be uh, some sort of a closer match to a star schema. That is what gets you the best performance. Now, when you're working with, let's say, a sample data, let's say AdventureWorks or any other data set that you've made, generally, the data set is going to be provided to you in a way that translates into a star schema. Maybe you will have dimension tables, customers table, products table, Maybe. sales table, things, things like that. But then when you're working with more real-time problems, like you step outside of sales and you go into operations and HR and other systems that just throw out the data. There is no fact table, there is no dimension table and things like that. It's hard to kind of talk about a data modeling training approach to an Excel user. How do you take an approach towards that? I mean, do you talk about it in your trainings? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And uh, so I, I misunderstood what you're saying. So, yeah, when you get AdventureWorks, it's on a platter, right? And it is a star schema. So that's the point I think you're making. And the reality is that normal data in the business is not like that. And in addition, normal data in the business is often not clean. So it's got errors right. in it. There's missing fields and those sorts of things. So, so there's a cleansing process here. But the way I like to do it is I have a PowerPoint slide. PowerPoint is my go-to drawing tool. It's the easiest tool to draw. You can draw boxes and words and stuff. And so I always start off with transactions. So ultimately, we're, going, we're talking about some sort of transaction, right? So if I use my solar electricity example, it's how much electricity was consumed per 15 minutes. That's the transaction. Okay. If I'm talking about my river um, data, it's how many gigalitres of water passed this point uh, in one day, right? Sure. That's the transaction. If sure. we're talking about the bank accounts, it's the transactions are the individual um, deposits or withdrawals you from make, your yeah, bank account. Sure. So the way to think about this is start off with the, ask yourself, what are the transactions here that we're talking about? And so once you know what the transactions are, you say to yourself, how do I uniquely identify each of these transactions? Mm -hmm. um, and so um, now you may or may not be able to uniquely identify your transactions. But then the next question, once you know what your transactions are, is I always ask who, what, when, where, and why. Now, I actually learned this from Arby Singh. I'm, I'm sure you know okay. Arby. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so course. I actually learned this from Arby. So, um, so start off with your transactions and then ask yourself who, what, when, where, why, maybe not why, who, what, when, where. Okay. And so in the case, now you, you might not always have a pure fit for this, but let me go back to AdventureWorks. So who, so the transaction is a sale. It's a, it's a, a cash register sale at a point of sale. So who, well, that's the customer. Sure. Right. And so who becomes a dimension, right? So I need to know everything that's important about the customer. And, and I need to uniquely identify my customers. Right. right? Oh, if, I, if, I can't, if I can't uniquely identify my customers, when, when I say who, I don't know which customer it is. So I need to have a record of who the customer was in my transaction table. And I need another table, a dimension table, that uniquely identifies every customer. So that's who. Uh, what? Well, that's the product in the case of AdventureWorks. So it was it was a, a large bike with a 27 inch wheel, or it was a, a crank set, or whatever. So that's what. So you need to have a product key, a product code, in mm -hmm. the transaction table, and you need a product table, right? So so this who, what, when, where is all about what are the dimensions that you need to build. Every dimension must have a, a unique identifier, and that unique identifier must also be in the transaction table. And literally, when I talk with clients and I teach people this through training courses, I we go through this process and we start to build our star schema in PowerPoint. I'd always do it in PowerPoint. Interesting. I never, oh, interesting. I never start in Power BI. And I draw my tables. Now, you would know having read my book, but a fact table should be long and skinny. That's right. Long and skinny, as few columns as possible. Long, skinny fact tables. Dimension tables short and fat, all right? So we want dimension tables to be short, 
but they can be as wide as you want. And so I draw this in PowerPoint. So I draw short, fat tables at the top, long, skinny table at the bottom. And we have to make sure that we have the same unique identifier in both tables. And then because once you think through those problems, you're you're actually developing the um, yeah. the production plan for That's your model. Right. That's right. Now, I, you know, I do this for a living. And so I can do this on the fly. But when I'm when I'm getting with a client and I'm not really clear what their data is all about, and perhaps right. they're not even clear about what the data is about either, <laughs> then right. just having the conversation facilitates the discussions that are required to flush out uh, what we need. So then the next problem is that that's what we need, but that doesn't mean that's what you have, right? So yeah, often, <laughs> often the data is not in that format and some work needs to be done. Maybe it could be because you have a distributed business where you have four or five different business units and the transactions exist in four or five different databases. Right. Well, but once you understand the transaction table requirement, you build that table in the five different business units append them together and you end up with your transaction table that you need. And then you do the same with your other dimensions. But that's the process that I teach and go through. Would you talk about modeling before talking about DAX or would you talk about after talking about DAX? Like what's your so sequence? I, I think the probably the correct answer is modeling comes first. That's right. But there's an interesting um, little pass off because you build, you probably build your fact table and your dimension table in Power Query, right? Because that's the tool for reshaping your data. But I don't consider Power Query, Impact Power Query is not a modeling tool. So when I talk about my PowerPoint design up front, we, I'm talking about modeling. And implied in this is a one to many relationship between the dimension table and the fact table. Right. But right. through that process, you might discover that you need something else, maybe a bridging table or a many-to-many -many relationship. Oh, that might get flushed out. But the point I'm trying to make is that that thinking is modeling. The process of building those tables in that shape is an ETL. That's shaping, Absolutely. right? That, that's Power Query. So even that's though right. you're, you're building those the dimensional model in Power Query, you're not doing modeling. The thinking process is modeling. Is modeling. The building process is ETL. That's mm -hmm. right. Okay. Getting it to the shape so that it looks like the model that you were on, on the paper, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then coming back to your question, which comes first, modeling or the DAX, um, it sort of reminds me of a very common experience I have because uh, I do sort of ad hoc consulting, you know, just basically phone a friend, give me some money and I'll, I'll help you solve your problems. <laughs> but people will often say to me, I've just got a problem with this DAX formula. Can you just help me with this DAX formula, uh -huh. right? And, you know, we have a look at the DAX formula and I have no idea what's going on. I say, before we do anything with the DAX, let's have a look at the model, right? So show me the model view. And more often than not, that whole modeling process has been skipped. And so, and That's if right. you don't know, if you don't know what you're doing, I mean, you, you can understand how people get in this situation. And in fact, sometimes a little bit of knowledge can be dangerous because often what will happen when businesses are moving over to Power BI is they'll go to their SQL people and say, hey, you guys have got the database. Um, I mean, the, you're, you're responsible for the database now. Can you load up the data in Power BI for me so we can build something out? And so mm -hmm. they don't understand the difference between a relational database, which is SQL Server, and a basically analysis services, which is a reporting tool, which is right. designed and optimized for a star schema, as you mentioned before. Right. Interesting. Interesting. If you maybe had to, let's say, interview somebody as a BI professional, not just as a power BI professional, just like general data analysis, BI professional, what are the few things that you're going to maybe test on him? Hmm. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure I've got an answer for this one. I haven't done a lot of um, hiring myself of BI people. I'm not sure that I could do a generic interview and I have no real need to do that. I mean, I would only interested in hiring Power BI people. So if I was going to interview, a, I'm, I'm changing the question. It's a no worries. No worries. Guest, guest <laughs> license. Um, I mean, if I was interviewing someone for a Power BI job, I would ask them to explain context transition to me. Um, oh. I mean, it, it depends the level that you're, that you're going 
for, right? I think if you can understand context transition, in actual fact, this raises another really important point. It's one thing to look at something and understand what the problem is and fix it. So I, let's call that level one. Let's call level zero. I can look at something, there's a problem, I don't know what the problem is and I don't know how to fix it. Right, the next level, now I might miss something here, but the next level is I understand the problem, I know how to fix it, but I don't really know why the fix works, oh, but I okay. do know what to do to fix it. Because this exists. Yeah. You can, you this can exists, know yes. It. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, and then there's another level where you understand the problem, you know how to fix it, but you can't actually explain it to somebody else. Okay. You know, you sort of understand how it works. If I ask you the next lesson is context transition, could you stand up and teach the class? That's a different level of understanding. And and I have to say that teaching other people and writing a book has given me so much depth in my understanding of the tools that we're using because if you learn with the view of teaching somebody else, you learn at a different level Certainly. than you otherwise would um, learn. So I would probably, I wouldn't start off with context transition. That might be a, a bit much, but, you know, I'd ask people about relationships. What are the different types of relationships in Power BI? And when would you um, give me an example of where you'd use a many-to-many -many relationship? And I'd certainly ask about context transition, maybe calculated columns versus measures, you know, just some general questions. Sort of a little bit, it's not, not directly answering your question, but many of the people would be aware of the PL300 exam. So Microsoft uh -huh. got, has got That's a right. data analytics exam, the PL300. Um, I'm due to sit it again. I, I did it last year and apparently you have to renew it every 12 months to maintain your credentials and they've expanded the content a little bit i would say it's quite a broad uh, knee deep foray into power bi so you don't really go deep into anything they're not going to ask you to explain context transition but they do ask you to write a dax formula that solves this particular problem and you don't have to write from scratch you've got a bit of drag and drop ways of doing things so it's a little bit of computer assisted but because it's quite broad you actually have right. to know everything to be able to answer anything at a quite a not a deep level but an intermediate level i guess and this comes back to your earlier point shandeep about you know what would you focus on and so and i'm not saying that focusing on power bi administration is a waste of time i'm not saying that at all and i'm not saying focusing on paginated reports is a waste of time either but i just think for a data analyst if you can know how to use everything in power bi desktop and if you can learn a little bit of sql i'd say it's not essential but it's sql is not hard to learn now I'm not talking about optimizing the SQL database um, using indexes. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying understand the differences of how you query a database. That can be very helpful in, sure. in your data analyst journey. And then there's other tools like I've, I've got an interest in Python mm -hmm. personally at the moment, mm -hmm. um, but I just find I don't have time for it. I want to do it. I'll probably learn Python when I retire. Um, it's, a tool, it's a tool that I know I could use to my benefit. But the learning curve is, is just um, higher than the amount of time that I've got to commit to learn. But, you know, if someone's earlier in their career and they want to, if they want to do some programming, I would highly recommend learning Python. Python. Um, okay. It's a very broad tool that can be used in many different ways. And, in fact, you can actually embed your Python code into, into Power BI. Probability. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I mean, That's Python right. and R are probably the two, the two tools. Python mm -hmm. tends to be, in my understanding, more of a utility nice, whereas R tends to be more of a statistical analysis tool. That's so right. if you want to go down a data scientist path, as they learn R. If you want to go down a data wrangler, data analyst, that's a, and if you've got some time, as they learn Python. Interesting. Interesting. For the consulting work that you do, Matt, for companies, how would you maybe help a company which is currently grappling with Excel spreadsheets and Google Sheets to get started on their journey with Power BI? And I'm talking about a company per se, like you're talking to a very senior executive, maybe the CEO, CFO of the company, they talk about the problem that they're facing. They even show you the reports that they're making all out of Excel and Google Sheets and things like that. How would you advise the company to get started on structured bi practices maybe using power bi what what's your course of advice for them smaller companies maybe yeah it's an interesting question and, I, and i'll tell you why i find it an interesting question so i spent 15 years working in the business i was the guy building those excel spreadsheets right. for 15 years right and then on the other side of the business we had it they were the people who were trying to get rid of the access databases trying to get rid of 
the Excel spreadsheets thinking we should go for these more, let's call it robust enterprise strength tools. And a lot of companies have these sort of competing groups of people, you know, the traditional IT versus the, let's call them the power users in that business. And I've also been on the other side working in IT, trying to get people to standardize and stuff. So I sort of have had a bit of both. And I, I have empathy for business users who run their business on spreadsheets. Um, now, that doesn't mean that if they're running on spreadsheets, it's the right solution. All I'm saying is I have empathy for them because <laughs> there's a trade-off between an enterprise solution, which tends to have long development timelines, high cost. They often not only do they have long development timelines, but there can be a long lead time before they can actually start on a project. Right, so all of these things are real. And then in the meantime, the business has something happening next week that they need to report on. True. So what are they supposed to do? Do they just say, well, let's just not do that because we can't report on it? No, that's not what they do. They use Excel and they use Access to solve these problems. So, But to come back to you know the broader question, well, I, I think you have to understand why, why is the business using Excel? Why is that a problem? I mean, I don't think there's a problem with businesses running Excel as long as it, it's robust. I mean, there's a whole lot of potential issues around Excel errors and those sorts of things which you can take into account. But often you'll find with Excel solutions or, you know, there's a lot of manual effort to maintain them over time. Of course, there's the chance of having errors. I think Microsoft's done a lot of work making Excel um, compatible with Power BI. And so, you know, I think I would be recommending pick something meaningful, but not too big to start with. And it might be the p &L. I would start with something that could deliver time savings, could deliver consistency improvements, and where the data is relatively good. So, you know, people, I do a lot of work with companies and see CFOs building a P&L balance sheet, cash flow statements, those sorts of things. And I always tell them up front, this is easy as long as your chart of accounts is in order. If your chart of accounts is not in order, we're in for a world of pain here. Mm -hmm. The journals, journals are normally pretty good, but what tends to happen in businesses that use Excel to do their reporting is instead of fixing the chart of accounts so that all the expenses are in the same number range, they yeah. say, well, well, hang on, I'll just leave it where it is and I'll just move it in Excel and I'll change the sign and yeah. that fixes the problem, right? That's right. And so right. businesses have got those sorts of workarounds in their Excel solutions, then perhaps it's not the right place to start. You know, you're better off to start with something that's got some clean data. But in order to migrate from that Excel world, you can actually have the best of both worlds. If we can get a model built and it's deployed, um, you can actually deploy Excel pivot table workbooks connected mm -hmm. directly to Power BI. Because often you'll find a CFO or some senior, typically finance people, to be brutally sure. honest, who are absolutely passionate about Excel and they don't want to move and they're not interested in learning a new tool. I mean, it, it, it happens. I Yes, yes. I faced that myself, yes. Yeah, so I would pick something that's manageable, that would deliver some value. I would also make sure that find someone internal who's going to be the um, super user over time. Um, if you can get someone within the business who's going to own it, who's passionate about building it, then it's going to be a much uh, easier process. I don't recommend generally people just outsource the stuff to me and I'll give it back to you and it works because there's there's no ownership then. The other thing I'd recommend is get IT involved from the beginning as well. Now, mm -hmm. in, embedded in your question, implicit in your question, implies that maybe the IT uh, manager has come and asked for this anyway, but it could be, uh, it could be a CFO or a, a CEO, I guess. Um, but, yeah, so if, if there is a traditional IT department get them involved from the beginning as well i always recommend if if assuming there's going to be some ownership in-house and um, do some formal training first and so you know you and i talked before about dimension tables and one That's to many right. relationships and fact tables i can't have that conversation with end users That's and it right. people if they don't understand the language of power bi That's and if right. they don't understand That's why right. why something's required so I always recommend, I mean, I can teach you. We can we can learn as you go, but there's no substitute for one or two days of 
of focused learning. Just learn first and then we'll be able to go faster by doing this together because then when we have a meeting, we say, okay, we need a dimension table for your chart sure. accounts. They know what I'm talking about. That's right. Leading up to what you just said, for example, a business owner or a CFO wouldn't really understand the language of Power BI. They probably wouldn't even heard of the term ETL, although they are doing a bunch of ETL in Excel, but they wouldn't have heard of the formal term ETL, data modeling and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a this is also a thing that applies to me and the problems that I have faced in the past. So I have been asked a lot of times in the past to deliver a training sessions for end users, like people consuming the reports rather than making the reports. And my question to you is that what, in your opinion, would be a good, let's say, curriculum to talk about, which doesn't really expose them to the nitty gritties of Power BI, but also makes them a good end user of Power BI? What would you say is a good thing to teach them? Well, i tell you what I do. So I think there are three different levels of user for Power mm-hmm. BI. So there's the report consumer. Mm-hmm. So they log into powerbi.com. They ideally go to a Power BI app. Right. If they're going to a workspace, they're not clicking the edit workspace button. So they never see the data. They never see the tables. They never see DAX. They never see the... All they see is the report that's being built and they can interact with the report. So that's a report consumer. That's right. Secondly, we've got the report builder. Mm-hmm. And so that's someone who can go into edit mode, add a new report page, build a new report, build a drill through report, add some spark lines on a data model that has already been produced for them, right? So they Mm -hmm. don't, you know, as they start to make the journey, they might write a simple DAX formula. They can't do it online. They have to do it in desktop. But um, so that's the report builder, building reporting capability on top of a data model that somebody else has produced. And then the third level is the data modeler, the person who gets the data and loads it up, builds the model, has a modeling understanding. Now, your question about the end user really is the first level that I, that first I mentioned. Level. That's right. And so what I always recommend to the clients that I'm working with is that they get that key, that super user that I talked about before inside. I, I say they're the people that should be teaching your end users. I can do it for you and I, I will do it for you, but I think it's better for them to take ownership of that because remember what I said before about if you learn in order to teach someone, you have a deeper level of learning. So that Very gets their buy-in. And Very then the other thing is that we actually build the reports first. So you don't, we shouldn't be teaching those people on adventure works. We should be teaching them on their own data and the data that makes a difference to them. And so you have to go through All of those other things, the data modeling work, the report building work, and then build the training and then train the end users once you've got up and up to date operational reports. The other thing that will happen if that super user is delivering the training is that they'll understand the 50 questions that come from the consumers, the report consumers, and they'll be able to have that um, meaningful conversation about what needs to change in the report. Because as good as the report super user is, there's going to be things that they didn't think of and the real end users of the reports will think of. And so having them as part of that delivery process helps. Um, more specifically um, on what I'd be teaching them, I'd just be, you know, teach them how slices work, how drill through reports, but it's really on the functionality that you've built within the report. That's right. Um, That's right. I mean, I would certainly, I think it's worthwhile teaching people how to use, um, analyze in Excel. Um, Absolutely. If necessary. Yes. Yes. Um, I yes. would I would show them how to export to Excel, but I would encourage them not to do that for the reason, you know, we don't want them to do that. But then I, if I go back to my very, remember I said my first customer I was building Power Pivot reports for. And after not too long a period, sort of the word got around that, you know, if you want something, this guy will get it for you. So I started building reports. And so people would say, can you come over here? Um, I need you to build this for me, right? So I need you to build this. That's I said, right. oh, okay, what do you use that for? Uh, well, I use it for my monthly reports. So show me what you do with it. Oh, then I do this, I cut this, and I do this. Okay, then what do you do with it? And then I do this, I do this, I do this. So, okay, then what do you do with it? Oh, and then I give them this. I say, well, do you want me just to build that, that last thing, instead of uh, thing three? 
oh, can you do that? You know, and so the point, and this comes back to the Apple thing that I said to you before as well, is that often people don't know what can be built. They don't, they have, they don't have enough knowledge of what's possible sure. to be able to know what to ask for. And so if you only ever go and ask those end users what you want, what they want, the answer they give you will be very limiting because True. they don't know what Absolutely. to ask for. Whereas if you can get those super users involved, if you can get the right person, someone who's curious, and get them to look at the way the end user is using the report and see that they're doing this export and then doing X, Y, Z, then you know what you need to build into the next um, iteration of the report. And they won't get that if if you get a third party trainer to do that delivery. So that's the way I do it. Of course, it's not the only way to do it. I'm not saying you can't do third party training on end users, but that's what I encourage my, my customers to do. Um, I could also go in and, and help super users deliver the training if that's what they wanted to do as well. Sure, very interesting point. I mean, I really love the idea of the developer or the modeler training the seniors himself as to like he has built the report so he'll be able to make a lot of sense and talk yeah. context rather than just vague data or vague visuals yeah. and things like that. Compared there's one to... more thing i want to say which is so, it's not directly related to your question but it is related often at my training course so i'm i now do a three-day training course in fact jason is my full-time trainer microsoft certified mm -hmm. trainer so he does all the delivery so we do a day on report building a day on power query a day on data modeling that's basically our three-day introductory course Quite often, I'll get a senior finance, typically it's the CFO, but it doesn't have to be. It could be um, a senior exec in a smaller company coming mm -hmm. along to the course. They're never going to do the data modelling. True. But they'll come along and they'll watch and they'll participate. And importantly, they learn what is possible. Now, often these people, particularly if they're in finance, they've come from a an Excel world, an Excel pivot right. table world maybe, and they might have even used uh, Microsoft Query as a tool or certainly cut and pasting Excel. And even though they're learning and even though I know that they will not necessarily be able to execute those skills themselves when they leave, it creates awareness in their mind of what's possible. And that's important because then they know what to ask for from the people that will be doing the work. Hopefully they're in the room as well. That's right. So they'll know what to ask for. They'll know what's possible. They'll be able to push back if the answer is no. So hang on, I remember we did that in that training course. I, it must be possible. Go and find a way. So sometimes people, I talked about those three different skill sets, and I guess I'm sort of adding this, another level is that if you bring a senior person into that deepest level the data modeler so that they understand what's possible could be a cio even though they're not going to apply the skills that they learn their knowledge of what's possible will help elevate the success Very of uh, the project very interesting. Uh, I think it definitely helps to understand what is possible and then ask, uh, you know, more insightful, deeper questions than what you could get otherwise, if you wouldn't have known that this was possible enough in the first place. So yes, for sure. All right, great, Matt. Uh, I think I've been well past the sacrosanct one hour mark. It's one hour, I don't know, some couple of minutes ahead. Yeah, uh, no problem. Last few questions. What are you working on these days? What keeps you busy? And in case people need to reach out to you for anything, your trainings or anything, where should they contact you? Well, my web website acceleratorbi.com.au i don't know if you can put that in the in the links sure. below um sure we, ha we have a shortcut for my website so it's xbi.com.au that takes me to the did website you buy the well. second domain as well like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay uh, if i <laughs> talk about um things <laughs> that we've learned over our career i mean um <laughs> accelerator bi seemed like a good idea at the time but it's very hard to spell and if I had my time again, I'd probably do something like um, my mate Gilbert Quivilius has done. He's got formu.com, so much easier to remember. But anyway, um, yeah, so um, – and if you Google me, Matt Allington, normally it's the first um, – the first few links that come up will be me. Sure. Um, so at the moment, yeah, I'm doing – I do mainly consulting. Jason does all of the training delivery. Training this year has really picked up, which is fantastic. It's been a pretty tough couple of years. I don't know what it's been like for you, Tandeep, but, you know, face-to-face -face training has been virtually non-existent for the last couple of years, but really coming back strongly now. So, uh, so we're pleased to be doing a lot of training with clients here in Australia and online. I have a, another business with Ken Pools, who I'm sure you also know. 
Uh, so Ken and I this. run uh, SkillWave training, skillwave.training, and, um, and so we do a lot of video on demand training up there. And then the consulting work that I do these days, in fact, it's always been this way. It's very, uh, it's very targeted, bespoke. And I mentioned before, it's phone a friend. It's a little bit bigger than that for many clients. So I've been, you know, maybe done 50, 80, 100 hours work for some clients. But some clients I'll do 30 minutes work for and then I don't hear from them for a couple of months and then they call me back when they've got a problem and I help them out again. So yeah, I, I really, I really enjoy the variety and flexibility of that type of of working models so i've normally got some time so if anyone is looking for some help i used to do a lot of work in forums and those sorts of things my blog's been a little bit neglected lately i've, I've been a little bit too busy but i think um, you've been yeah. posting more of youtube videos now uh, i see that i have i have been yeah. yeah and i'm not sure if the viewers are aware but it's a lot of work to write a blog i mean a, <laughs> yes. a, a blog that i a, a typical blog i write would be somewhere between two and four hours of effort and, um, and so, you know, 10% of my business week, if you want to put it that way. Um, a video, you know, in many ways, it's it's a lot easier. I also have uh, Romana who works for me. She's my uh, professional video editor. So, she, you know, she helps fix up the mistakes that I make and, and gets them out. So it just means I can push out a little sure. bit more content. Great. Great, Matt. It was lovely catching up with you. Uh, we've spent quite a bit of time talking about the work that you've done and interesting learnings for everybody to take a look at. Uh, whether they are consultant or just maybe starting out with Bar BI. So thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you very uh, much. I uh, really enjoyed the chat. I appreciate you reaching out. Thanks, yeah, Jim. I hope to catch up with you once again sometime later. Yeah, hopefully in some conference somewhere uh, at some stage. So um, yeah, yeah. I don't think it's going to be this year, but uh, maybe next year I might make what, my way you, over to Europe. Or if I'm not mistaken, Dubai. I think you were due to travel to the conference uh, in Denmark. Uh, this, uh, this no. Yeah, no. Um, I, I, conference? I, I decided not to go. So. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I didn't get the visa, so I couldn't really go there. <laughs> My yeah. visa got cancelled, so... so I yeah, so I didn't plan to go. But last time I was in Europe, I was in Slovenia, um, and then I we had a conference in Brussels, and then I went to um, Portugal and spent some time over there with uh, Rui Romano. So, so that was three years ago now, a bit over two years ago, actually. But, yeah, so it'll be... Maybe next year, and maybe right. we can something happening in Dubai. Who knows? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Thank you, Matt, for your time, okay. and all I right. hope to talk to you again. Yeah, thanks, like, see you all.